morning, all North Cross comers. We want to thank you for joining us and tuning in. Join us, join us in hearing the word of the Lord and receiving his grace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your love is so powerful. It can bring together the most unsuspecting individuals in that we don't need to search far and wide to receive your grace. The fact that your grace is readily available for us is such a blessing that I frequently take for granted. That simple notion puts the unconditional nature of your being on display for all to see and receive. As you are here with open arms, we are here with an open mind, Lord. Amen. Please stand and join us in worship. seen the God who heals. I know when I ask, I'll receive it. Cause you're not a God who withholds. And I hear you say, just believe me. I need a holy Something stronger than lightning. The Lord inside of these veins, a holy ghost awakening in my soul. I need a love that blows out and in my bones to live in joy. the fire, I can't even explain it. It's like I'm bursting with a heavenly language. And every time I get a taste, I know I just want more. I just want more. You're the kingdom that's been growing inside me. It's like the lion's or the wants to be me. And every time I get a taste, I know I just want more. I need a holy in my soul, I need a love that you know better than my bones to the evidence shows. I need a holy ghost, working in my soul. I need a heart that will never go die wherever I go. The holy, holy ghost, I need a ghost. The holy, holy ghost, I need a ghost. The holy, holy ghost, I need a ghost. Good Lord, there's no question that certain days are harder to get through than others. It's nearly impossible to satisfy the needs of everyone around us, but we try. It's impossible to be in multiple places at once, but we still try. 
it's impossible to make everyone happy, but we still try. And it's impossible to do it all, but we still try. These instances provide us with the opportunity to make decisions that can affect the outcomes of our lives. The stress associated with this is one of the many reasons why your grace is so sweet, Lord. We put on the strength and your breath lifts it off of us. Good Lord, thank you so much for being our rock. They say sometimes you win some Sometimes you lose some And right now Right now I'm losing back I've stood on this stage night after night Reminding the broken it'll be alright But right now, oh right now I just can't It's easy to sing when there's nothing to bring me down when I'm here to the flame like I am right now I know you're able and I know you can Save through the fire with your mighty hand But leaving you My hope is They say it only takes a little faith to move a mountain. The good thing, little faith is all I have right now. But God, when you choose to leave mountains unmovable, Give me strength to be able to sing. It is well with my soul. I know you're able and I know you can. Save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is you alone. And I know the sorrow and I know the hurt. It all go away if you just say the word, but even if you don't, my hope is you alone. You've been faithful, you've been down all of my days. Jesus, I will cling to you, come what may. Is up your able and I know you can and I know you're able and I know you can see the fire with your body believe and if you don't my heart
For a brief moment, I deserted you. But with great compassion, I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment, I hid my face from you. But with everlasting love, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, our, your Redeemer. This is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall be removed, shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. Before you sit down, just take a moment um, to welcome those that have chosen to join us here in our sanctuary and house this morning. You can love on those that are around you, those that may be on the other side of the room. You can give them a wave. We are so glad you've decided to worship with us this morning, those of you at home as well. So take a moment um, and just greet those around you. All right. 
I do want to just give a, a quick update. I know um, we have been getting we've been get, getting some uh, messages just asking how Chris is doing. He occasionally does send out um, a uh, update on the uh, daily devotional list. Um, so if you are um, a part of that, um, hopefully you've been getting those. But he is recovering well. I mean, I would say that he's um, doing well enough that when I do talk to him, he's, you know, in good spirits to give me a hard time, just like he usually does when he's up here at work with me. So that's a good telltale sign that he's uh, readily getting back to normal. So Chris, continue to rest, get better. Um, we are looking forward to having you um, back with us in February. Again, these last two Sundays today and next Sunday week, we'll continue to have Reverend uh, Dick Hooten. And uh, just again, thank you, Dick, for giving this month of your time to serve the people here at North Cross. So we want to thank you for that. So um, my children's moment this morning. Um, what does it mean when you hear the word permission? If someone gives you permission to do something, what are they basically telling you that you can do? That you can, you can do it. Well, there's kind of a little more fancy word that's called um, commission. And a commission is, in my mind, a step that's a little bit higher than permission because if someone gives you permission, it may be a, a one-time thing. But when it comes to the word commission, it's when someone's giving you authority you know, it's, it's something if someone gives you permission, you may not be able to go and tell someone else to do it. But when someone commissions you, they're giving you the authority to go out and do what they have asked you to do. Um, so I'm going to ask my helper to come up here this morning real quick. Um, so I'm going to commission you to read this message to everyone. So I'm going to take my microphone off. So can you take that over there? Now open that up, and can you show, can you read that, and what does it say? Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Can you go and tell that to your mom over there and your sister? Can you go tell them, say, can you tell them that? He did it for those that, uh, you at home. Um, so yeah, that's a, a beautiful thing, is that when Jesus commissioned us, he told us that we can go out and share his name to the world. And because he did that to the disciples, that is why we are sitting here this morning. And that commission is given to us. And this morning we may hear a little bit more about how that all started because when Jesus went to those first disciples, they weren't disciples. They were fishermen. And God called them to come to him. And that's what he does to us. And when he calls us, he then commissions us to go and do his work. So can you all remember that this morning? Over here, can we remember that? And you at home, I pray that you'll remember that too. And speaking of prayer, let's bow our heads and we will go to the Lord in prayer. Um, gracious and heavenly Father, we are grateful to be in your presence. And if we just take moments sometime to really dwell on that and think about the powerfulness that that we can come to you and just sit and be in your presence. Um, it can be an overwhelming thing if we just take those moments each and every day to just bask in who you are and what you have called us to do. And I pray this morning, dear Lord, that all ears that hear will be mindful that you have called us to something. And there may be those that are sitting in this room this morning those that may be listening at home that have not accepted that commission um, to go and share your name with others. And I pray that you will begin to work on our hearts this morning um, to hear the message that will come about the great opportunities that await us when we dedicate our lives to follow the one who has called and commissioned us. Um, so help us remember that each and every day of our lives, dear Lord. And as always, we ask these in the most powerful name under the heavens, your son. And all God's people said, amen.
Good morning. Y'all doing all right today? It has been a pleasure to be with you these weeks in January, and I know you're looking forward to Chris's return. The gospel lesson this morning is from Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately... They left their nets and followed him. And he went a little further along, and he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat and the hired men, and they followed him. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. So God, we thank you for your love for us, for this time that we can come together to be with each other, to be with you, to hear your word and your will for our lives, to give thanks to you, to give praise to you, to remember that we are yours and that you call us to go forth and spread the good news. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So three or four years after Francie and I got married, we were in North Carolina. Uh, While we were there, we visited some of her friends from seminary, and uh, they, like us, are a clergy couple. And at one of their churches, they were in the middle of a revival. You remember those revivals? Um, And the revivalist was somebody who was a contemporary of us, a guy named Andy Lambert. And the night that we were there with them, he shared a song about Jonah. That I'm going to try and do a little bit of justice to. Let me tell you a little story about him. About old Jonah, God sent him on a mission to a wicked Nineveh. He didn't want to go, thought he gave God the slip, so he headed out of town, booked passage on a ship out of Joppa, headed for Tarshish. Well, the next thing you know, the waves begin to roll. 
The ships rock and sew, the sailors search their souls. Jonah, it looks like it's either you or the boat. We wish you all the best and we hope you can float. <clears throat> the captain and the crew were filled with fear. Sailors all said, Jonah, move away from here. They said, Nineveh is the place you ought to go. So they grabbed him by the bridges and they tossed him out to sea. Ocean, that is, swimming fool, sinking star. I guess you can say that it was Jonah's lucky day, if you can call it luck, to be a fish entree. Three days later, he had a change of attitude. Nothing changed your mind like being fish food. Whale bait sealed his fate. Jonah and the Lord had a little heart to heart. Get me out of this fish, and I will do my part. God gave the big fish the rumbling belly flew. He heaved and he hurled and he coughed up a Jew. Jonah, that is. <clears throat> The moral of the story is simple, but it's true. If you haven't got it yet, let me spell it out for you. God's love is as big as the world is wide. You can run from him, but you cannot hide. Jonah tried. He almost died. Jonah, you come back now. You hear? <clears throat> and as you can tell, I heard it. And like all preachers do, we steal from each other. I asked Andy for the words. And I've used it a couple of times in the past. The song, of course, is based on the story of Jonah. Uh, the part that we are most, most familiar with, God told Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach repentance. He did not want to go. Uh, to Jonah, the Ninevites were the enemy. And he would have preferred to remain just, he would, re would have preferred that they remain just as they were and suffer God's punishment. I mean, why risk preaching repentance? After all, the Ninevites might actually listen and obey God and therefore avoid punishment. Jonah's response to God's direct command was to run away. Remember, you can run, but you cannot hide. That's where, that's when we encounter uh, the story of Jonah and the big fish. Jonah was doing what he wanted to do. He was not doing what he needed to do for God. And we all know what happened. The ship, was, uh, the ship he was on encountered a huge storm at sea, and in order to save their ship and their lives, the sailors, well, first they throw all their cargo out to sea. But that didn't help. And then they all cried out to their own gods, and that didn't help either. Finally, when they realized that Jonah was the problem, they threw him out to sea, and suddenly the sea ceased from roaring. While the calm sea made believers of the sailors, Jonah was sinking into the deep. And that's when God provided a big fish to take care of Jonah. And then after giving Jonah three days in the belly of the fish to think about it and to pray about his situation, God had the fish spew Jonah out on the dry land. Francie uses an especially um, um, vivid phrase to describe this. She calls Jonah whale barf. <clears throat> the truth is, God knew what Jonah needed, and God sent a big storm to help, and God sent a big fish to help. And God knows what we need also. Sometimes God's help can come from very unlikely sources. And the question I want us to consider this morning is this. When God calls upon us to do something, how do we respond? Do we seriously pay attention or do we, like Jonah, try to run away? Sometimes God gives people some time to respond. For Jonah, he spent three days in the belly of the fish to give him time to think about it and to pray about it, uh, about how he was going to respond to God. If you will, he kind of had a sort of prophetic time out. And as it happened, once Jonah arrived in Nineveh, this is the message he proclaimed. It's really very simple. Forty more days and Nineveh, Nineveh shall be overthrown. And just as Jonah feared, the Ninevites repented of their ways. 
just as Jonah feared. Now, I'm sure if any of you are on Facebook or any social media, you've probably seen some memes making the rounds lately of uh, Bernie Sanders sitting with his gloves and stuff on. The most recent one I've seen just this week, and it was very timely, uh, if we can pull it up. The Assyrians rep repented and Nineveh is spared, and Jonah goes and sits under a broom tree and pouts. Seemed very timely. Um, Jonah had a little bit of time to respond. There are other times when God demands an immediate response in the, the gospel lesson this morning. We witness Jesus walking along the Sea of Galilee, and he calls out to Simon, and he calls out to his brother Andrew, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And the gospel tells us that immediately they left their nets and they followed Jesus. It's a pretty dramatic story when you stop and think about it. They left their jobs, they left their families, they left their homes, they left everything behind to follow Jesus. The time was right. And Jesus preaches, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe the good news. Maybe you remember this word, repent, from early in the season of Advent. In that time, it is John the Baptist who is preaching repentance. And he, like Jonah, I mean, they're all preaching the same message. But by the time we get to this morning's lesson, John has been arrested. He's in jail. Yet he has prepared the way for the Lord. And now it's time for Jesus. And so what does Jesus preach? Repentance. What does that mean for us today? What do you think of when you hear the word repent? If you're like me, uh, sometimes you might think of one of those TV preachers thumping on his Bible with one hand, holding out the other hand, give me money. Um, maybe we don't like the word repent because it makes us look at ourselves a little more closely and we might not like something we see. You remember the story I shared last week about the British philosopher with the answering, well, the questioning machine? The questions were, who are you and what do you want? Do we know who we are? Do we know what we want? And if we've done that self-examination, do we like what we see? Have we been as faithful as we have been called to be? Have we fed the hungry and clothed the naked and cared for those who are sick and in prison and welcomed the stranger? Or have we been more concerned about ourselves, about our jobs, our houses, our cars, maybe even our own families, maybe even our own churches? Is there something we need to turn from, to repent from, so that we might more fully embrace the kingdom of God? Jonah and John and Jesus all say, repent. Turn from your old ways and welcome the ways of God. Why is it that when we are called to repent, often we look about it with about as much enthusiasm as we do with the smelly task of cleaning fish? And yet, and yet, the message of repentance is really good news. Yes, we may have to confront our own sins, but the goal is to bury those old, dead, smelly fish so that we might go fishing for the big one. Jesus says, I will make you fish for people. But it takes total commitment. It's all embracing. Nothing can be left outside it. No provisos, no escape clauses. It is complete obedience. God was not ready to accept some sort of watered-down loyalty from the prophet Jonah. Neither Jonah nor Nineveh would be made whole by half measures. Jesus permitted no rival loyalties from his disciples. How could he, without betraying his disciples, by offering them something second best. It's why when we, 
When we get to some of those very hard sayings of Jesus, some of them might cause us to stumble a little bit. No wavering. If you put your hand to the plow and you look back, you are not fit for the kingdom of God. Oh. Even families have to come second. Don't love mother and father more than me. Oh. Even your own physical life might be on the line. If you try to save your very life, you will lose it. But if you lose it for my sake, you will find it. It takes total commitment. Peter and Andrew dropped their nets. James and John left their father in the boat with the paid deckhands. Matthew left a very lucrative profession. When I was pastor in Zwali many years ago, several members of the church had lakefront homes on Toledo Bend. I know that's the other side of the state. Some of you know Toledo Bend. Um, a lot of them had lake homes. Uh, one in particular comes to mind because although he had a lakefront home, he wasn't very much of a fisherman. Yet his house was right on the lake, and he had a boathouse, and he had a boat, but he was only kind of half-hearted when it came to fishing. And as a result, he didn't catch many fish. Um, so I would kind of like to ask, why, why do people go fishing? Well, for many recreational fishermen, any reason is good enough to go. My best friend from high school still spends most of his free time on the water, actually Toledo Bend or sometimes down on the Gulf Coast. Uh, together, uh, when we were in high school, we spent many hours fishing for bass, for brim, for sockele. Uh, the fishermen we encounter in today's gospel lesson fished for a living. Um, some fish for peace of mind. Some fish for the challenge of outsmarting the fish. Jesus called Peter and Andrew and then James and John to fish for people. Why? Well, the object was not to gain something for themselves. The object of this fishing mission is to give something away, to give away the gift of eternal life. So what does it mean to go fishing with Jesus or for Jesus? Well, first off, you need to enjoy fishing. And I suspect that there are some people here this morning that really don't care very much for fishing, perhaps for a variety of reasons. They're afraid of the water, or it's too messy, or maybe it's boring sitting there with a pole in your hand, uh, or maybe it's just too much trouble. But fishing with Jesus is not something to fill us with fear or dread or frustration. When we fish with Jesus, we get to see the faces of those whose lives have been changed by the power of God's love. And to be honest, it may not be something we really enjoy until we try it some. It's only after we've caught a few people for Jesus that we share the joy of the catch with others and then work on becoming better fishers. Another thing about fishing with Jesus is we have to go where the fish are. The reason a lot of fishermen, fisherwomen, come home with empty ice chests is because they haven't been where the fish were. So what does that mean for us? Well, we need to be on the lookout for what the needs of this community are and how we might fill those needs. It may mean more of an effort to reach out to our youth or to reach out to the disadvantaged or maybe those who have experienced divorce. You cannot expect the fish to swim to us. We have to reach out and go to them. And another thing about fishing with Jesus is that we have to use the right bait. And I admit I may be taking the fishing analogy a little bit too far, but when I go fishing for sockele, or when I was in West Louisiana, they called them crappie. Some people call them white perch. They're all the same thing. Um, I don't usually have much luck fishing for sockele with worms. I usually have much better luck if I use minnows. Now, we're not really trying to bait people. It's not like we're trying to catch them so that we can feed on them. When we fish with Jesus, 
We're not trying to lure people to their death. We're trying to lure them to a life with God, eternal life. And some folks have used entertainment to try and accomplish that. And some folks have promised prosperity. And some have appealed to social prestige. And I think all of those baits are missing the mark. The only bait that is really worthy of the gospel is love, love that accepts people where they are, love that is demonstrated through our actions. Maybe there are people out there that only you can reach with the gospel. I mean, think about it. A friend, a relative, a neighbor, a coworker, a classmate, somebody that you encounter, who are they? Who is it that you can reach with the gospel? Think about it. Identify them, write their names down, not to share with the church, but to keep it fresh in your mind. Um, How can you share God's love with them? Do they need a friend? Maybe that's the first step. We need to be friends with people. Uh, Do they need a babysitter? Uh, Do they need somebody to help with chores around the house? Have they recently lost a loved one? Send them a card. It doesn't have to be complicated. It is just about making an effort to share God's love. Do it as a fisher of men and as a fisher of women. If we let God show us, use us to show his love, we might just be amazed at the results. Those results are not up to us. They are up to God. All we're asked to do is to be fishermen and fisherwomen for Christ. After all, it is a fishing commission. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you love us and that you love all those folks that we encounter each and every day. Some we know and love, some we may not especially care for, but you love them and you call us to love them. Help us to reach out and share your love with the people that we encounter day by day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and, can you hear me? Uh, please stand and worship with us.
tell us to go forth this day. Go in the love, the grace, the mercy, the strength of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Share that love, grace, and mercy with the folks that you encounter this day and all days. Amen. Thank you.